to the Eight Impact Investment Symposium today. Now, first of all, to get a little bit out of the way, we will be recording today's session and uh, we'll put it online so anyone who participates in the session, we will take this as, uh, as you can. Uh, at the start of the year and publicise our work, we decided to open up the January gathering of the symposium to the wider business community. And if you're one of our symposium members, welcome back. We're privileged to have your support and your ongoing contribution. For those of you who are coming to the symposium today for the first time, lovely to see you here. You're very welcome. The symposium has over 60 members who are all leading investors, social entrepreneurs, academics, philanthropists, or change makers. In addition to the monthly gatherings, we have five action groups where members work behind the scenes to tackle various topics in the areas of ESG, social enterprise, purpose-driven business, and impact investment. Edinburgh Napier's initiation of the symposium reflects our ongoing commitment to engaging with our wider community and working with others to improve society. So Bob Keeler, CBE of AB15 Consultancy and ex-chair of Scottish Enterprise, has been central to the success of this symposium and he expertly chairs our sessions. So thank you, Bob. I will now pass on to you. Thank you, Gail. With that set up, this is obviously going to go wrong. So my plan is for us today to finish by 12. Uh, for those of you uh, watching the time, for non-members today, if you're interested in finding out a little bit more about what the symposium does, then there'll be more information at the end of today's session. But today, it's our privilege to welcome uh, our principal speaker, uh, Professor Alec Edmonds of London Business School. Alec is hugely popular TED Talk with just short of 2 million views called for what to trust in a post-truth world. A little bit about Alex. When, when he taught at Wharton Business School, he won 14 teaching awards in six years before moving on to his current post as Professor of Finance at London Business School. He's produced many important academic papers on issues including sustainability, social responsibility, and investing. His research has been covered across the media and across TV networks. He's been asked to give evidence in Parliament. He's spoken at Davos at the World Economic Forum. And he serves as a volunteer in the Advisory Council of Resurgio, an organisation which, amongst other good work, supports emerging social entrepreneurs. Now, Alex's talk today is based on his recent, recent book, Grow the Pie, How Great Companies Deliver Both Purpose and Profit. The book's been hugely well received and it's been named in the Financial Times as one of the best books of 2020. So we're in for a real treat today. Now, at the end of the talk, there will be an opportunity for questions and answers. And uh, Alex will be joined by another impressive guest, Mary Jane Browers. And I'll introduce Mary Jane fully just before the Q&A session. So I'd like to hand over now to Alex. Alex, the floor is yours, sir. Well, thanks so much, Bob, and thanks, Dale, for, for the invitation. It's great to be here, and just a big shout out also to Wendy Wu for, for organising this and to everybody for joining. So, as Bob says, I'm going to talk about business purpose, and you did hear Bob correctly. I'm a professor of finance, so we often think that finance is the enemy of purpose, right? If I was a professional a professor of philosophy or business ethics, maybe I speak about this topic, but actually what I want to highlight is that purpose is not just worthy, something which is fundamental to a business's success. So even a hard-headed CFO should take this seriously because it's something which is linked to uh, long-term returns. So um, let me um, actually just start by telling you a story. So I'd like to take you away from your home offices and take you to a journey uh, around the world. And I'd like to take you to the Great Rift Valley. So this stretches across two continents, from Lebanon and Asia to Mozambique and Africa. So it has some of the, some of the world's highest mountains, but also some of the world's deepest lakes. Next slide. And one of these lakes is a lake called Lake Magadi, which is in the Kenyan stretch of the Great Rift Valley. So it used, you might think, well, it's hard for you to imagine that you're here because you haven't seen it before. Uh, but you have seen it before. You've seen it in the movie, The Constant Gardener, based on a John le Carre novel. Next slide. Can you not make me a co-host or something rather than just a uh, attendee? Because that would make things much smoother. Um, so millions of people around the world have seen this lake because they've seen the movie. Uh, but fewer than a thousand people call the lake their home. Uh, and one of these people is a gentleman called Emmanuel Saronga. Next slide. Uh, 
who makes a living selling and herding goats. So it used to be that for Emmanuel, cash was king. So it's cash that he gets if he sold a goat, but then he'd have to check that cash for forgery and store it at the risk of robbery. And then if he wanted to bank that cash, he would have to travel to the nearest bank, which was an entire day away. So his life was really tough. Um, he, he couldn't grace his goats in the greenest pastures. He had to always be with them one day of a bank. But all of this changed in 2007 due to a responsible company. And that company is Vodafone. Next slide. Because in 2007, Vodafone launched m which is a mobile money service in Kenya. So let me explain what mobile money is, because we often think about mobile money as mobile banking. Right? I have a Barclays bank account and I can choose to operate it on my phone rather than going to a branch. But that's not mobile money, because mobile money, you don't even need a bank account to begin with. And that's really important because 15 million Kenyans had no access to the banking system. So this transformed Emmanuel's life. Previous slide. So he no longer needs to worry about cash. He can grace his goats wherever he wants to. And he um, has a record of every single transaction on his phone. And we don't want to make a too much out of one story. But there is a study which showed that within the first seven years of the launch of M-Pesa, 200,000 households in Kenya got lifted out of poverty. And many of them were headed up by women because it allowed them to move from agriculture to business and retail. So that's one story about Vodafone. But let me now tell you a different story on Vodafone. Two slides further. Thank you. Okay, this, this story surrounds tax. So in 2012, Vodafone became the first company within the telecoms industry to launch a tax transparency report showing how much tax they were paying to um, governments around the world. And that's really important in something like telecoms because you could choose to locate your licenses in low tax regimes. So I've got two questions uh, for everybody to think about. Next slide. So the first question is, which of these decisions created most value for society? And the second, next point, is which of these decisions, if it had not been taken, would have led to the most public outrage or worsened Vodafone's CSR rating or reputation? Now, I'm not going to poll anybody here because I'm pretty sure that most people will agree with the answers. So which decision created most value for society? It was the first one. Right, by launching m please go back to the price slide. By launching m Vodafone lifted 200,000 households out of poverty and contributed to gender parity. But what would have been the consequence if Vodafone had not launched m yeah. It would have been nothing. Well, you don't get into trouble for not launching an innovation. You don't get a customer boycott for not launching a Pazer. Why? Because customers have never, would have never even guessed that it was ever possible to do this crazy idea of banking without a bank. But what is the consequence of not being transparent on tax? It is that there would be public outrage. Next slide. So, indeed, in 2010, Vodafone had suffered a nationwide boycott of its stores because people thought that it had underpaid tax by £6 billion. So, what is the big picture? So, why do I want to introduce my talk with these two stories? Previous slide. We often think that responsibility is about the answer to the second question. Why right? businesses should do no harm. They should not cheat on tax. They should not pollute the environment. They should not mistreat their workers. And obviously, all of those things are really important, right? So we businesses should not create harm. But you didn't need me to, to invite me to tell you that businesses should not create harm. You already knew this before coming on this webinar. 
So instead, what I want to do is to change our thinking so that responsible business is more about the answer to the first question. It's about actively doing good. Why? Because I think in 2021, given the scale of the social problems that the world faces, it's not enough for a business to just do no harm, right? Just paying our taxes and not mistreating our workers, that's good, but it's not enough. We instead want businesses to actively contribute to solving the world's social problems. And so that goes to uh, the framework that I introduce uh, in the book, which um, Bob kind of referred to. If we could go two slides forward, please. Right. So we often think about the value that a company creates as being given by a pie. And that pie can be given either to investors in the form of profits, that's the blue, or society in the form of value, that's the orange, and that value could be taxes to the government, it could be wages to workers, and it could be low prices to customers. And we often think that responsibility is about splitting the pie differently. Next slide. So if companies would sacrifice their profits to help wider society, then that's something which helps everybody. And clearly a fair division of the pie is important, but it's limited. So why we can't think about responsibility is only about splitting the pie differently is for two reasons. Right, so the first is that, well, if, you, if responsibility means making less profits, then some business leaders won't want to do this voluntarily. So indeed, we've seen cases of companies signing the business roundtable statement and not putting it into practice. And you might think, well, why would they? Because if responsibility means the blue goes down and profits are lower, then a business leader might just do this to the minimum possible. And secondly, the problem with viewing responsibility as splitting the pie differently is that it's bad for investors. Now, many people think, I don't care. Right? We often like to believe that investors are nameless, faceless capitalists. Investors are them. Society is us. If we can take from them and give to us, then that's good. However, I probably don't need to tell this audience that investors are not them. They are us. They include parents saving for their children's education. They include pension funds saving for retirement. They probably involve Edinburgh Napier's endowment, which is saving to fund future research and teaching. So any repurposing of business must absolutely take investors seriously. So that's why my view of responsibility, next slide, is that it's about growing the pie. Next slide. So absolutely, we do want to increase the orange, but the way we do that is not by giving them a greater share of what's already there. It's not by sort of donating a lot of money to charity, but through actively creating value by being relentlessly committed to innovation and excellence and doing some crazy ideas like launching this idea of banking without a bank, which is what Vodafone did with M-Pesa. And the beauty of that is even though that was a decision which was taken in order to create value for society, not to make money, ultimately, Vodafone did make money from it because it found a way of monetizing it and probably employee engagement was much higher because they were solving a massive social problem, which is financial inclusion in Africa. So if we go to the next slide, just to sum up the first part of my talk, what I call this in the book is pie economics. Now you could love or you could hate that word, but regardless of whether you like it or not, let me go to the definition. It creates profits only through creating value for society. So let me just pick apart this definition briefly, right? So the, this final four words, creating value for society, right? We knew that that was part of a responsible business, right? You've run a lot of these impact imposing symposiums before. But I think the, first, the middle four words are the ones which are more interesting, right? It is part of the responsibility of business to create profits. And if there is no clear link between purpose and profit, then we always will doubt whether a leader is going to be genuinely committed to it. But another important word here is the word only, because there are other ways of creating profits, right through extracting from society, price gouging customers or underpaying workers, 
but the word only means that we view social value as the end goal, but if we achieve that, then we make profits as a byproduct. Next slide. So this point in the talk, right, you might think, well, everything I say sounds great, but it seems almost too good to be true, right? So where is the evidence, right? It seems a little bit like wishful thinking that if a company serves society, it magically becomes more profitable, but this is a bit too good to be true. So this is why indeed much of my own work as a professor is to look at rigorous research and to figure out, does this actually hold um, in large scale? So given the technical issues at the start, let me skip actually three slides forwards just to make sure we have enough time for the discussion at the end. Thanks. Okay, so what I wanted to do myself was to look at are responsible companies actually going to perform better in the long term? Because you have this other view that maybe responsibility means that you're a fluffy company that is distracted from the bottom line. So for that, I wanted to come up with a measure of responsibility. Now, this is tricky because you might think, well, can't I look at a company's purpose statement? But as we know, right, some companies will have some great purpose statements, but never actually put them into practice. And so rather than looking at that, I looked at how a company treats its workers. Now, you might think, well, why workers? There's also the environment, there's customers. But I chose to look at workers because I had a very good measure available, which is the list of the 100 best companies to work for in America. And why that was such a good measure was that it was available from 1984. So purpose is a pretty new phenomenon. And many of the measures have only been around for, let's say, 10 years. And if I showed you that purpose paid off from 2010 to 2019, you might think, well, 2010 to 2019, that was a boom period for the stock market. Maybe purpose only matters when times are good, but maybe when times are bad, if we're in a pandemic, purpose is a luxury, let's forget about it, let's just focus on survival. Because I looked at data from 1984, I had things like the financial crisis, I had the collapse of the internet bubble, and so I could look and see, is this robust to the state of the economy? And obviously, there's lots of things I need to address. Is it correlation? Is it causation? Is it employee satisfaction that causes better performance? Or is it once a company is doing well, it can think about its employees? But again, I'm afraid I'm going to skip this just to make sure we have time uh, for Q&A. So let me just go to the next slide, which is the big uh, bottom line, which shows that the 100 best companies to work for in America delivered stock returns that beat their peers by 2.3 to 3.8% per year over a 28 year period. So that's 89 to 184% cumulative. So this is serious business, right? Because some, to, to some degree you might think, well, isn't it obvious that if you treat your workers better, your company will do better. But it's not obvious because treating your work as well is, is costly. And indeed, there are many companies that try to hold worker wages down or work them as hard as possible. This is the approach of companies such as, say, Amazon and Sports Direct and BHS. And often it will be the finance people who think, well, let's control our costs. But what this suggests is actually, if we think about treating our workers better, this is not just something which is good for them, but it's something which is good for the entire business. So this should not just be an HR issue, but a CEO level issue, which is why I'm saying purpose is something which is different from corporate social responsibility. It's not something just to be delegated to one small department. It should be something that the board and the C-suite is paying serious attention to. So let me go again three slides forward just to make sure that I have uh, enough time to get through everything. Thank you. So the big question here was, well, how do we actually put this into practice? Right? My message is, yeah, companies should be purposeful, but that might be as useful as technical football team score goals. Right? That sounds great, but how do we actually score goals? So now what I want to get to is the elephant in the room, which is how does a purposeful company make decisions? Right? Because we know how to make decisions under shareholder value. Right, business school professors like me have been teaching for the last 50 years, we do a net present value calculation. When we think about an investment, calculate how much money that investment will make in the future, 
discount the cash flows and compare it to the cost. Now that works if shareholder value is the objective, but if purpose is the objective, we need to have some other criteria. Now there's some people who sort of sweep this under the carpet and say, well, companies should always do the right thing, right? They should always continue to pay workers who are furloughed in the pandemic. They should always help to reduce the carbon footprint. But that's just not realistic, it's not commercial, because companies still need to make money and survive. So on the next slide, what I try to do is to develop three principles that companies can um, put in. Next slide, please. That companies could implement in order to try to uh, decide what investments to take and what to turn down. And again, I'm not going to have time to go through all of them because of time. So let me just go through the third one, which is called the principle of materiality. So to explain what I mean by materiality, maybe a good place to start is to explain what I mean by purpose, because it's a theme to the talk, but I've not given it a formal definition. So we often think that purpose is a synonym for altruism. Right, a purposeful company is one that serves everybody. Right, We might have that first red bullet point, so customers, workers, suppliers, the environment, and communities, and investors. Now that sounds fantastic, but it's really unrealistic. Because in reality, there are trade-offs, right? So let's take Engie, the French energy company. It had to think about, do we shut down Hazelwood, which is the most polluting plant in the OECD? If we shut it down, it's going to be good for the environment, but 750 workers are going to lose their jobs. So if our goal is to serve workers and the environment, that's not really helpful because this decision helps some and hurts others. So if we think about what the word purpose truly means, it means being focused and targeted. If I held a purposeful meeting, that's a meeting with a clear agenda. And if I do something on purpose, I'm doing it deliberately. So this is why I define purpose as being, um, as why a company exists, who it serves, its reason for being, and the role it plays in the world. And the answer to that has to be focused just like a person's purpose could not be to be a doctor and a lawyer and a teacher and an entrepreneur, you would be one of those things. And so this is the idea of materiality. Yes, we do care about all of our stakeholders, but there will be some who have to be first among equals because there will be difficult trade-offs. So the next slide, what I'm showing you is this materiality map, which I'm sure some of you will have seen which um, Sustainability Accounting Standards Board goes industry by industry and highlights what it views to be the most material stakeholders in that industry. For example, in extractives, then the environment is material, you've got a huge impact on it. But for financials, right, well, at least your direct impact on the environment is not that high. What matters much more is social capital, selling practices and product labeling. We don't want to be in a Wells Fargo fake bank account scandal or a payment protection insurance scandal. And so if I go to the next slide, this gives me the final um, study that I'm going to show you. What this looks at is the MSCI ESG data set, which is perhaps the best known data set for ESG performance. And it takes companies that do well across the board. They do well in every dimension. And it finds that they actually don't beat the market, right? They only beat it by one and a half percent per year in terms of shareholder value, and that's insignificant. However, next bullet, if they do that same thing with a materiality lens, they take companies that do well on only the material issues, but they scale back on the immaterial ones, they do beat the market by 4.8% per year. So surprisingly, it's better to do well on only a few things than to do well on everything. Because if you're trying to do well on everything and be all things to all people, then perhaps you're forgetting about your share. And so that takes me to the final section, next slide, is, well, how do we think about this in a pandemic? Next slide. So what we've seen is we've seen some companies which have done some tremendous responses in the pandemic. And what they've done is they've split the pie more fairly. So there's some executives, who are being paid zero, so that fewer workers have to be furloughed. There are some companies who are continuing to pay their workers, even if they are furloughed. And there's some companies which are um, helping out customers. So Unilever is giving 100 million euros 
of food and sanitizer to local communities. So these are massively inspiring examples and any company that has done that should be widely praised. But the problem of thinking about responsibility as splitting the pie differently is that not everybody can split the pie differently. Right? What if you don't have 100 million euros lying around? Or what if you don't have food and sanitizer? You're just not in that industry. So this is why I like to view purpose as being about growing the pie. Next point. So this is why I started with the example of innovation, thinking about how can we deploy our resources and our expertise, be this Vodafone with telecoms, to solve a very different social problem. That's one of financial inclusion in Kenya. So I think any business leader can ask herself, what is in your hand? Right? What are the resources and expertise that your company has, and how can I redeploy them to serve society? And so that can lead to some amazing examples. So Mercedes, right? they make Formula One engines. That's not really helpful in a pandemic. However, what is in their hand? It's precision engineering. So the same precision that you need to make a Formula One turbine and piston, that's something that they're using to make CPAP breathing machines, which are a less invasive alternative to ventilators, because that absolutely also needs to be precise. What about large companies hit by the crisis? Let's take Qantas Airways, right? They've had to furlough a lot of workers. And uh, yeah, people will say, do the right thing and keep paying them. But that's just commercially unfeasible because their revenues have plummeted because nobody's flying. But what is in their hand is a relationship. And that relationship is with Woolworths, which, unlike the Woolworths in the UK, Woolworths in Australia is a grocery store. It used to be that if you bought groceries, you get some air miles and Qantas. Now they've leveraged that relationship so that if you're furloughed from Qantas, you're now working at Woolworths. And finally, what about a small company? Well, we hear these stories of Unilever donating 100 million euros. You think that's great, but if we're a small company, we just need to focus on survival. But even a small company can be able to help out. So let me end with an example of a small company that I'm a um, customer of myself. It's called Barry's Bootcamp. It's a brutal gym in London, so people like David Beckham go to this. In the Edinburgh Festival, actually, two years ago, they had a, a stall um, on uh, World Mile. Now, they're obviously um, shut right now, um, but what they were able to do was to offer free online Instagram classes to people who are self-isolating at home. Now, you might think, well, that's great, but that's not hugely innovative, a fitness company offering fitness classes. But here's the great thing. Let's say you're a desk worker at the gym, you work at reception, right? The gym is shut, what can you do in the pandemic? Well, what it turns out is that many of these desk workers are actually actors as their main job, but because acting is a volatile career, they also take this desk job to provide some income stability. And if acting is your job, then what is in your hand? You're really funny. Well, how does that help out in the pandemic? Well, what we have is a lot of working parents where their children are at home because schools are shut. And so what they had was some Zoom storytelling sessions to take the load off working parents. Now, that might seem a small thing, but it plays a big part if maybe you've got kids at home and you've got a um, big, important Zoom call or presentation. And this shows that even a small company is able to play their part in a pandemic. I guess I'm going to hand back shortly for the discussion, but just in two, two slides time, why I chose to um, write this book, two slides forward, please, um, is because I think for far too long, people have thought about purpose as being fluffy. There's a moral case for it. Like if you can afford purpose, you can do it, but actually it's just a luxury. But what I want to highlight is that purpose is something consistent with being commercial, with delivering financial returns to your shareholders. And this is not just based on wishful thinking, but a lot of evidence. But as the academics among us know, right, when you write an academic paper, you have to write it for other academics and get go through the nitty gritty and the weeds of methodology. What I wanted to do is to take that and translate it into practical frameworks for a practitioner audience and to come up with some examples of how companies have succeeded and also have failed in terms of putting it into practice. So I hope that might be a useful resource. 
thank you very much to again for everybody for for the invitation and for bearing with me for the with with the technical issues let me hand back um to the discussion excellent thank you very much alex um fascinating talk um i, I i've been through those dilemmas several times over the years in the past standing in front of shareholders trying to explain why purpose and values was actually the way forward for the business um, and most of them agreeing but one or two of them being very challenging and saying no no that's not what we want you to do so i've been through some of these dilemmas in the past a lot to think about here um, i'd like to get a discussion going now i'd like people to start as asking questions so everyone uh, that's participating here today feel free to enter questions via the chat icon um, and if you, if you you can either read out the question when I come to you, if you can unmute and ask the question yourself, uh, if it's a short question, I'll read it out for you. Um, for this Q and A session, Alex is being joined as promised by Mary Jane uh, Browers. Mary Jane is a consultant to SIS Ventures, a subsidiary of Social Investment Scotland, which invests in enterprises with an embedded social mission, regardless of the legal structure. Mary Jane is a graduate of Cambridge University. She has vast experience in equity investment, including a fund manager, investment executive at Archangels. Um, in addition to her role with SIS Ventures, she currently has various other roles and responsibilities, including a non-exec director with early stage companies. She's a judge in the Converge Enter Entrepreneurship Challenge, and she's on the board of Museums, Galleries in Scotland, which is a national development body for Scotland's museum sector. Mary Jane is an all-round champion of good corporate governance, and will be able to give us a perspective as an investor, a director, and somebody familiar with the Scottish business scene. So welcome Mary Jane uh, to, to, to join the panel. That would be great. Um, Thanks. Mary Jane, can, can I ask, um, could you start by giving us a little bit of perspective on, on Alex's research? Uh, was there anything about the findings that surprised you or chimes with you in any way? Thanks, Bob, and thanks, Alex, for the uh, great presentation. The thing that surprised me most, the really exciting thing that came out of Alex's presentation is that what CIS Ventures is doing is delivering economics. That is exactly what the purpose of CIS Ventures is. And, and so it's been great to hear the 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 research behind it, uh, we came to that at CIS Ventures through solving a particular problem. So it's not a story like the, the, the Vodafone one, but we had uh, a business came to CIS looking for funding, but they needed a lot of money and the debt products that CIS had available wouldn't be sufficient. And that was the realization that CIS ventures need to come into in, in existence in order to support innovative companies to deliver purpose. Excellent. Thank you for that. Uh, uh, Alex, whilst we've still got you, you uh, here as well, I'd like to say there's an interesting story about your book about learning to ski and what it taught you about manipulating statistics. Would you would you give us a quick uh, share of that particular story? Absolutely, yes. So I I, I um, learned to ski. I it's more um, I wasn't I, my family wasn't wealthy enough to take me to the Alps when I was young. So I didn't learn to ski until I was doing my PhD at MIT. So every January they had a, a ski trip uh, to Smugglers Notch in in Vermont. And um, when I was learning, I, I I was obviously on the green slopes. And being a sort of a finance nerd, I wanted some measures of, of progress. And so I thought, well. I let me fall down fewer times today than I did yesterday. But then I, I really knew sort of how I could manipulate these statistics where I would just go on the easiest slopes. And even if I did like a controlled experiment and went on the same slope, I could just make sure I turned a bit many more times and went down more slowly and just to avoid failure. And often we think like right, per businesses should avoid failure, like right? we should do no harm. And obviously that's part of it. But I think much more important is to actively do good to create value. So when you launch a new idea, there's a chance that it's going to fail. But I think the goal should not be to fail, just like the goal of skiing is not to fall. It's to enjoy yourself and to have a lot of fun. Obviously, part of that is not falling. But part of it is to ski with freedom and abandon and challenge yourself and go down the slopes. And so this is why I like to think about responsibility as not just doing no harm, but also actively doing good. 
I like it. Thank you, Alex. So I've got a couple of questions come in. Uh, the first one's from Evelyn McDonald. Uh, Evelyn's got a PS in that as well. So it, Evelyn, can you unmute yourself if that's possible and uh, you can ask the question directly. Evelyn comes from an organisation called Scottish Edge, which does a lot to fund a lot of great uh, potentially high growth organisations. Oh. Right. Yeah, I've been unmuted. Thanks. Great presentation and really looking forward to reading the book. Um, but I was intrigued by the fact that you were you were saying that um, if a company only focused on a few things, they achieved more growth you know, versus trying to do it all. And one of the reasons I'm interested in particular, I was wondering if you could give us some examples of this, because I also mentioned as a PS that this round of the competition, Scottish Edge has introduced impact as one of our judging criteria. So there's six judging criteria, but impact is going to be judged alongside the others, the, the, the typical ones you would expect, value proposition, business growth potential, the team. What we're looking at is for people to have considered what impact they are going to make with their business. Now, obviously, what we will see is people that are, are focusing on specific things and then we and I've no doubt we will also see people that are trying to do it all so just interested in some examples around why focus is important yes absolutely so so one example I'll, I'll give you an example on the positive side and and one on the negative side and then I'd love it if, if Mary Jane also has some examples from her experience so on the positive side so Coca-Cola they have this initiative called Project Last Mile and so what that does is it makes medicines and vaccines available everywhere in, um, in Africa, including the difficult last mile to a rural school or hospital. And so why do they do that? Because it's really linked to their expertise, right? So their expertise is they need to make sure Coke is available everywhere in Africa. And um, so they can use that expertise to make medicines available. And you might think, well, why medicines? Why don't they make books available? Because literacy is a big challenge. But with medicines, they need to be transported cold. And with drinks, they have this expertise in refrigerated transportation. So I think that's a great idea because that's using your bang for your, your expertise to achieve the most bang for buck. Mm -hmm. Now, if we contrast that with charitable donations, the problem with the charitable donations is that that's not necessarily using the expertise of a company. So rather than, let's say, giving to charity, let's say Bob and I are both investors in Vodafone. Vodafone could itself give out um, higher wages to Bob and I if we were employees or higher dividends to us if we were investors. And then we could choose what social causes we'd want to support. Maybe I care about Cancer Research UK. Maybe Bob cares more about the environment. Or maybe I want to help out sort of a local coffee shop, which is struggling right now in the pandemic, but it's not necessarily for a company to, to make that decision because their expertise is not choosing the social causes that are most worthy. And indeed, there's also some large scale evidence showing that companies that donate to charity actually are underperform in the long term. And in some cases, why do they actually give to charity? They sometimes give to charities which are affiliated with the board of directors. So this is some way of the CEO trying to make sure that he or she is a bit or less accountable by um, showing some favour towards the directors who are supposed to monitor the work. Excellent. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks, Evelyn, for that. I've got a question here from Bob here as well. Again, if we could unmute Bob and allow him to ask his particular question. And, and Bob's going to be joining us at the next session as well. So a little bit of a pre-advert for Bob. Um, you'll just see how good he is just the way he asks this question. Well, typically no pressure from Mr. Keeler. Thank you very much. Um, <laughs> you know, Alex, I'm just interested. I mean, obviously, you know, there are a number of different ways of measuring impact and what sort of impact we're trying to measure. And there's a lot of um, there's a lot of focus on the companies and what they need to do. Um, but, and there's a lot of focus from individuals um, who who really uh, what we find over the years is you know when we do sort of investor surveys we take maybe 20,000 plus people globally and we go through a, an impact investment survey with them what we found is that overwhelmingly people want to invest for a better future but at the end of the day the access to those opportunities is, is somewhat limited both by education because their financial advisors and investment managers don't promote um, and also because there is there is a lack of consistency about the language and the metrics used to measure impact. 
So that's a sort of um, slightly irrelevant backdrop because my question really is about um, how do you see the impact investment scheme in Scotland, or is that just not relevant because you're looking at it from more of a global context? Sure, I'm happy to answer, but actually, uh, Mary Jane didn't have an opportunity to answer the last question. So I'd, I'd love to hear, hear from her first, and then I'll chime in afterwards if that's okay. Yeah. So, shall I, Bob? Yes, Mary Jane, um, please, please do. By way, by way of a, an, a kind of an intro, intro and responding both to Evelyn and Bob's questions there. I think the, the key, um, particularly in relation to Evelyn's, but this is also relevant, is the whole impact piece must not be a tick box exercise. And I think that's been one of the issues with the investment markets. ESG has been a thing, but it has largely been this tick box exercise. It's something that's added on on the outside. It's a, it's a subsidiary question. And even when you're looking at an ESG fund, it is still treated very much in that way, or certainly has been in recent times. So whether you're a judge on Scottish Edge or an investment manager, I think the key point here is that the impact has to be completely integrated into the operation of the business. It has to be the way the business functions. And there, I have a specific example which um, carries on from Alex's point about Coca-Cola. One of the investee companies in the Cisventures portfolio is an ad tech business called Goodloop. And Coca-Cola is one of the customers, okay? So arguably their business model is the charity donation one, where if you view the video, there is a donation to a charity of Coca-Cola's choice, of your choice as the viewer. But what is the video showing? It's showing the work that Coca-Cola is doing in water management. So what that does is brings up CSR points front and center to the operation, not just a nice to have. So that, I think that brings together those two points. And I, if I hand over to Alex now to, to answer Bob's question. <laughs> Thank you, Jane. Alex. Thanks. Um, so I, I think um, what's really important is, is the metrics of impact to be specific to the company's purpose. So we do have these initiatives which are trying to have comparable, harmonised metrics. Um, so the World Economic Forum is promoting that. But I don't think that's the right thing to do because really what is purposeful will depend on initiative industry. So let's take Doddler Dairy. What they're trying to track is the number of the income uplift to the smallholder farmers. And then on, on the other, uh, another quite different metric is within trainline.com where you will um, try where you put your train tickets right there like most businesses well like every business they'll look at female representation within the workforce but they're specifically looking at female representation within the programmers because that's uh, an area in which there's even more um, this, uh, there's even less um, diversity historically um, e e e electronic arts they also will try to encourage female um, uh, fe female uptake within the customer base because that's a particular challenge so I think it's important here to think about metrics being specific to a company now I know like a lazy investor who wants to just evaluate a company from his or her armchair might want to compare all metric because then you can just put this into a spreadsheet and and, and compare it but i really think these things have to be specific to a, an individual company so this requires investors to be have their boots on the ground and get into the weeds of a, a, a particular company excellent alex i mean that's that that resonates with me a few years ago we were doing a project in bangladesh and um, our, our task was to try and create a, a way for children that have no route into the formal education programme to get some basic reading and writing um, skills so that they could uh, pass the test to get into the, the first part of the education system. And because the alternative was they would probably end up working in the ship breaking facilities on the beaches of, of uh, Chittagong and Sangu. And, so there was quite a, a, a pressure there for this to work. Now, in terms of the metric there, the metric was simple. How many children got into the school system? So that's not a translatable metric that you could take across even other parts of the same business. But it was very clear once we got to 3,300 children getting into the, the school system, you're thinking we're achieving something here. We're changing the lives of children and their families. 
but the metric had to be focused on the specific benefit that we were trying to achieve. So I absolutely get that. Can I pose a question back to both of both of you, please? And this is about what you mentioned before, Mary Jane, there is about how ESG can sometimes be seen as a tick bo tick boxing, box ticking exercise. Um, what can we do to try and ensure that that's not the case and that the whole ethics behind that are treated seriously um, and properly? Any thoughts on that? I have a few. Right. Okay, we'll start with you and that'll allow Alex to gather his thoughts because I'm sure he's got a few as well. Yeah. <laughs> I suspect so. <laughs> I I think it's it's a cultural thing, Bob. Mm -hmm. And I I hope in a way that, that almost as a result of, of the pandemic and people being forced to think about the world differently, that we'll see an acceleration in the cultural change. And it's quite interesting sitting in different board meetings, which I've had to do because of my various roles, and seeing each board has a different culture. And some of them are immediately um, very much focused on purpose, and others are very much focused on traditional financial metrics. And the environment in the board meeting is different, depending on where the focus of the board is. And I think, I believe that we all have a role to play and some of it's in the, the language that we use. Mm -hmm. And for me, one of the key things is, is challenging, calling out when things are not appropriate. So if, for example, um, if you're looking at a business that um, does not have any diversity on the board, then everybody in that boardroom should be calling that out. They shouldn't be silent. So, so one conversation at a time, I think we can deliver a, a real shift here. And that means that, in my view, that the ESG uh, box ticking exercise is no longer external. It's an integral part of the governance of companies. But if I pick up of what you said there, Mary Jane, you say that probably a principal route to that uh, starts at the boardroom and starts with the, the people who are already present in the boardroom. Yeah. So what would be your way of influencing this this vast and disparate group of people? What, any, any thoughts as to how you how you might kind of uh, address them? Is it through the Institute of Directors, for instance, or is it is it the CBI or is it some other way of trying to get these messages more focused? Well, I, I think it's I think it's all of those things. I I think it's very it, it is going to be a gradual process. Top down does uh, contribute. But I think there needs to be much more of a, a bottom up movement and the acknowledgement that we can all change things. Okay. And, and I think everybody um, at the event today should think, how can I contribute to purpose, to the, to the development of economics? Uh, even a conversation in your corner shop or if you give feedback online, always think about the purpose behind the the financial transaction. Okay, yeah. thank you, Jim. Alex, your thoughts on this? Thanks, and thanks, Mary Jane, for answering, because as Bob said, that gave me a little bit of time to gather my thoughts. I like to think about some frameworks. So I've come up with the two sort of punchy, hopefully not uh, cheesy ways to think about that. So one is to move from quantitative to qualitative. So what do I mean by this? Like as a finance professor, I, I obviously would like to have numbers and measurement. And people often ask me the question, how do you measure impact or social value? I don't think you measure it. You can assess it, you can evaluate it, but that's different from measuring. Right, so how do we choose who to hire from our company? Yeah, we could look at things such as um, if they're a recent graduate, their exam results and their test scores, but we assess them. We look at other things which are cultural fit and interpersonal skills. And I think that's the same for, for a company. So we can look at things like um, diversity metrics, but as, as Mary Jane was alluding to, like you could sort of tick the box by adding a minority to the board and not really caring about diversity. So I know there's one leading investor and, and she asks CEOs questions such as the following. How are your people? Can you tell me about their main concerns and how are you addressing them? And there's some CEOs who will say, oh, here are the concerns, this is what we're doing. There are other CEOs who will say, I didn't know that you're going to ask me about my people. Next time, I'm going to bring along the HR director. 
<laughs> so that, that's really important because that says, well, who are the ones who consider their people to be a CEA level issue and who are the ones who think they can be delegated? And so that's the importance of boots on the ground, asking qualitative questions rather than looking at just the metrics. The second point is to move from output to process, right? So a metric just looks at the output, but not of how we got there. As we know, we can increase quarterly earnings by cutting investment, but simply that's the same with ESG metrics. We can improve, let's say, the pay ratio by paying our workers more, but not so much in terms of training them and giving them meaningful work. So in terms of processes, right, I know there is a board of a large FTSE 100 company where they will not allow an executive team to present a capital expenditure or a strategic initiative to the board unless they explain how is this consistent with the, the, um, the, the firm's purpose. Now, historically, right, how do you evaluate something? You present the NPV calculation, but this is something where they, they need to make sure that everything has a purpose justification. And that's just one company that I have not know. Maybe this is the case with a lot of companies as well, but there, the process, how does purpose get integrated is at the boardroom level. They don't allow major initiatives to be passed unless there's a serious discussion on purpose. Excellent. Thank you, Alex. And, th and thank you, Mary Jane, as well. Um, I, and and to, to Bob here, I do, I do recognise your, your willingness to help in that response, Bob, but in, for the sake of time, I'm, I'm going to keep us moving forward. But that was actually, I mean, it stimulated a lot of thoughts, and a lot of debate, I'm sure, for, for most of the people here. Uh, wonderful contribution. Um, if you want to read more about Alex's research, his book is available to buy through all the usual channels. He's also got some uh, great uh, Gresham College lectures on YouTube that you should take a look at. Um, for the symposium members, we will meet again next month. Our speaker will be Bob Hare, as we've heard, the head of uh, Edinburgh office of Casanova Capital. Provisionally, we've got that penciled in for the 24th of February. So that date, if you can keep that in your diaries, we will confirm shortly. Again, it will be a kind of one hour session. Um, and we'll also at that session, we'll have an update on the work of the five action groups that Gail mentioned in the introduction. For those of you who have come along today who are not regular members of this uh, group and you're interested in finding out more, best way to do that is to contact Dr. Wendy Wu, and that's W-U, um, at Edinburgh Napier University. You'll find their contact details online through Edinburgh Napier University website or through LinkedIn. Um, but before I close the event for today, I'd like to say special thanks back to, to Alex and Mary Jane once again my apologies uh, to you, Alex, in particular for the, 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 the gremlins in the system. When I said at the start that uh, having a good introduction meant that things were going to go wrong, I wasn't really meaning it. it just uh, it, It's just come out that way. So apologies for that. Thanks to all the Edinburgh Napier uh, team for organising this session for, and for continuing to bring along such high calibre guests and panellists to make this a, a fascinating and useful session. And thank you all for attending today. And uh, stay safe, everybody. Thank you. Thanks so much for the opportunity and thanks to everybody for, for their engagement and their questions. And I, I know there's some questions that we didn't get a chance to, to get through. So if, if somebody just, if you drop me a, a message on, on LinkedIn, I, I commit to answering all, all questions that people send me. I really appreciate the interest. Thank you, Alex. Thank you. Okay, that's yeah. it, folks. Bye -bye. Cheers.